it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. We built a portal gun. The whole thing was Ray's idea. Yes, I had a hand in it, but I swear I had no idea what his plans were. Hell, I'm not even sure he knew, to be honest. It was probably a year ago, give or take a month or two. I had a hard time making out his words at first, because he was just so excited, to the point of barely being able to form a legible sentence. The main thing I got from the phone call was to get to his house as soon as possible. He's usually a pretty composed guy, but something had him riled up, something serious. We've been friends since we were kids, ever since I helped him with a burgeoning bully problem in sixth grade. Ray was really shy, quite small for his age, so the bigger kids would lay into him pretty good. I didn't know anything about him at the time, but he always sat alone at lunch. When Ronnie Blige and his goons started harassing him one day, well, I couldn't let that shit slide. I wasn't especially strong or outgoing myself, but I never could stomach the bigger kids hassling the smaller ones. As soon as they swatted his lunch off the table and pushed him to the ground from his chair, I ran over before taking the time to consider my actions. Now, I'm not going to lie. I got my ass handed to me, but I stood my ground until Mr. Norris stepped in. He was a social studies teacher, and was about as intimidating as a half-flattened grasshopper, but he was still an authority figure. I ended up being suspended along with Ronnie and his friends, but it was enough to make them think twice about pushing Ray around anymore. After all, I did get a couple of good swings on him too. When I got back to school the following week, Ray couldn't thank me enough for stepping in when I did. We became pretty tight from then on. Jess was Ray's sister, and I developed a crush on her soon after my friend introduced us. And out of respect for my friend, I never acted on my feelings, but the friend zone knocked me out of the running anyway. The three of us spent a long time together over the high school years, and we managed to hold on to that friendship after they left for college. I never went to university myself. I was never the best student, due in part to my fairly erratic life at home. Oh, I won't go into specifics, but my parents' relationship was always rocky at best. Of course, I wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed either. When we learned the national anthem back in kindergarten, I wondered what a dancerly light was. Of course, I didn't ask anyone, <laughs> nope. I just assumed it meant really bright, and started using that shit in sentences. Wow, the sun sure is dancerly today. Can I close the curtains? It's way too dancely outside. Don't call me stupid. I'm dancelier than you. Yep, I was about as dancely as a cave in the middle of a moonless night. No, I, I wasn't particularly smart. I was always pretty mechanically inclined, so I ended up working at a garage after school. Working on vehicles paid well enough for me to get my own place far away from my folks and carve out a decent life for myself. Ray dropped out of college after a couple of years, while Jess worked on her law degree for many years after. She always did like to argue. And he was always quite the intellectual, but would he claim that school was just attempting to dumb him down? Were it anyone else who claimed that, I would have thought them way too arrogant for their own good, but not Ray. As soon as I pulled into the driveway, the garage door opened with my friend standing behind it. His house was nothing especially big or fancy, but it sat alone on a wide open area, with a long road that led directly to the huge carport that sat next to the house. Oh, this is going to be the big one, brother, he said as he ran up to my car, before I even had the chance to get out. What's going to be the big what? I asked, chuckling at his childlike enthusiasm. Two words, he began to say, before being cut off by his sister pulling into the wide driveway. Jess was with her husband, Elijah who was riding shotgun. He was a pretty good guy, but I can't say I didn't hold just the slightest bit of jealous contempt for him. Well, I'm fairly sure he knew how I felt about his wife, but he was cool enough to let it slide. Ray walked towards his sister and pulled her into a hug as soon as she got out of her car. He smiled at Eli and gave him an acknowledging nod, to which his brother-in-law returned the gesture. 
he waved us all to follow him into the garage, where he already had some fairly professional-looking blueprints spread across his work table. You're not serious, Jess exclaimed after glancing down at the prints. I worked it all out last night, Ray replied with glee in his eyes. Okay, you've officially watched entirely too much Rick and Morty, I said, laughing out loud after I looked at the mapped-out sketch of what was labelled Portal Gun. Eli laughed with me while Jess appeared to be trying her best to keep her composure. Look, I know it sounds crazy, but I swear to Christ it'll work, Ray said, looking between us. His voice sounded a bit pitiful, as we clearly heard his feelings. Just trust me, guys, he pleaded. I'll make sure we're all partners in this. Just have faith in me. Ray, you're my closest friend, I said. You know I've always got your back, but this is science fiction, not actual science. Now to call my friend a genius would be dramatically underselling his intellect. Though I had endless faith in his brilliant mind, I just couldn't wrap my far more simple mind around it. And after dropping out of college, Ray had started working on a variety of entrepreneurial ventures. I can't necessarily speak to what said work involved since it is as above my pay grade as my understanding. By the time he was 25, he had, well, several patents and was worth more than $20 million, and that's with only two years of college. So for him to call this ridiculous idea the big one, well, I couldn't help but wonder what he considered big. This is exactly what motivated my next question. Are you sure you want to risk your reputation on something like this? I asked. He seemed to consider what I'd said for a moment. He was generally very quick-witted, and rarely lost for words, well, with us anyway. Even with all his success, he was almost painfully shy and introverted. I was usually the only one he could confide in, which made this whole ordeal even more shocking. He was always close with his sister, and he even took to Eli pretty quickly. He tried to share his wealth with all of us, but Jess was already a very successful lawyer, and I was just too hard-headed to accept any form of charity. I did allow him to invest in my own garage, though. I couldn't rationalize just taking his money as a handout, but he was happy to be a partner in my maintenance shop. Oh, this isn't about the money, Ray said, breaking the silence that had begun to consume his garage. He looked at each of us with his eyes wide. There was a strange sort of desperation on his face that I'd never seen before. Nothing I've ever done has left a mark on this world, he continued. But this, he said, patting his hand on the blueprint, this is my legacy. This could change the world as we know it. My mind was made up before I looked at Jess and Eli for confirmation. I still thought this was completely nuts, but I always had my friends back. I wouldn't change that now, even if I thought his genius was giving way to a touch of madness. Okay, I said, giving him a half smile. What do you need me to do? Ray lit up like a kid on Christmas morning, while Eli and Jess nodded their acceptance of whatever this plan held for them. Though mine would be the hands that would assemble this thing, according to my friend's instructions, I was unsure what role Jess or Eli would play. For the most part, they had little to no involvement. I assume Ray just invited them to be a part of it since they were part of our small circle of friends and family. Well, the design was far simpler than I ever could have thought, but my friend had absolutely no doubt it would work. Some parts took some time to get our hands on, and others cost Ray an insane amount of money. He claimed he didn't care about the financial aspect, but I wasn't entirely sure I bought that. Still, I couldn't believe how much he was willing to pay out for this ridiculous venture. I'd never seen him so blindly driven before. Honestly, he scared the hell out of me sometimes. My friend had always been a calm and composed individual, but he completely lost his shit at times during this process. I'd never seen this side of him before, and I even began to fear for his sanity. There were several times during those first few months where he would throw parts across the room or pound on the work table until his knuckles bled. There was something in his eyes at those times that caused me to feel very uncomfortable. He was like a man possessed, 
more so than one driven by a goal. After three months, we finally had our first attempt finished. When Ray aimed it at the wall and pulled the trigger, it did little more than lightly scorch the wood, and he flipped out. He screamed at the top of his lungs and launched the gun at the concrete floor. He stomped his foot on it, yelling, swearing so much that his words didn't even sound like any form of recognizable language anymore. He proceeded to beat and kick anything in sight. He punched the wall until the wood splintered from his blows. As soon as this legendary tantrum started, I got the hell out of there. I just walked around to the back of his house and lit up a cigarette while he tore his garage apart. After a while, his guttural bellows didn't cause me to wince anymore, but it was probably a solid hour before he calmed down. What the hell was that man? I asked when Ray finally walked out of the demolished garage. I'm sorry, he replied, staring at the ground to avoid any eye contact. I've just put so much time and money into this, he continued. I can't fail. Maybe you should just walk away from this for a bit, I suggested. No, he screamed out as soon as the words had left my mouth. Oh, now, I said, backing away from my friend. I'm sorry, Ray said. I just, well, I mean, well, they, they won't. I, I can't stop now. They won't, I asked. Who are they? Ray continued to stutter, but he wouldn't give me a straight answer. He told me he wasn't feeling very rational at the moment, and not to listen to any of his crazy words. I finally got him settled down, and he agreed to take a few days off to clear his head. I was trying to get him to just drop this whole thing, but he wouldn't hear of it. We didn't talk for a couple of weeks after that day. It was probably the longest I'd ever gone without talking to him, but he'd freaked me out quite a bit. I'd gotten back into my regular schedule and resigned myself to just wash my hands of this whole ordeal. I felt bad for ditching out on my friend, but I wasn't going to take part in his descent into madness anymore. Well, just two weeks after his meltdown, Ray contacted me again. He apologized for the way he'd acted and practically begged me to come back and help him. I worked it out, he said in a trembling voice. I couldn't tell if he was just nervous about making his apology or if he was getting himself worked up again. After we talked for a while longer, I agreed to give him one last chance. I can't say I was excited about the prospect of taking part in this endeavour further, but he was my friend. After another two months, Ray's portal gun was ready to be tested again. My whole body was shaking as he aimed the gun at the wall of his garage one more time. My heart was racing. The device was simple in its design. It was almost shaped like a hairdryer. It had cables that ran to the heavy backpack. It made me think of a bad cosplay attempt at Ghostbusters proton packs. There were blinking lights and a couple of switches on the pack, while the gun itself had two knobs and a trigger. One knob was to adjust the diameter of the portal, while the other was to switch between entry and exit points. The toggles on the back were just to power up and activate the thing. I'm pretty sure the LEDs were just for show. My friend asked me to flip the switches while he aimed the gun at the wall. Well, here goes nothing, he said with his eyes wide and manic. As soon as he pulled back on the trigger, a small glowing circle of orange light appeared on the wall. He turned the first knob and the light widened before my eyes. After he let off the trigger... The circle of light changed to a perfectly round hole in the wall. He then turned the second knob and aimed at the opposing wall, leaving another equally round hole. Well, there was nothing special about how the openings looked. There wasn't exactly an enter here indicator, but Ray expected that. He told me to just be sure I kept track of which portal came first. My friend grabbed a basketball from a box to the side of the workbench. He gave me a strange look with a crooked half-smile before he tossed the ball through the first hole. Sure enough, as soon as the ball went through the left wall, it came bouncing out of the right. Holy shit, I said in a monotone voice, as shock would allow me no more than that. 
after closely examining the basketball. Ray gave me a wink and ran towards the first hole. No, wait, I yelled out, but he was running back through the right wall before I could even suggest that we run more tests first. He yelled out in a frantic and excited shriek after he arrived back on the other side of the room. We both laughed quite a lot when he thrust his arm through the left side and it popped right out of the opposing wall. You really did it, I said with a surprised smile. We did it, Ray replied with glassy eyes. He asked me to call his sister and to get her to come by. While we awaited her arrival, we conducted a few more tests. I tossed the basketball at the exit portal to see what would happen. Somehow it couldn't even go through. It just bounced right back at us. We lobbed a variety of things through the origin hole, and we didn't need to prove that worked anymore. Honestly, we just had fun watching them go through one and pop out of the other. After a while, Ray flipped off the backpack switches, and both walls returned to their previous state. Still, in complete disbelief, I smacked my hands against both walls to find them completely sealed and solid. Well, it'd still be a few hours before Jess arrived, so my friend and I just kicked back and celebrated our success with a couple of cigars that he'd bought for this very occasion. He wanted to hold off on the champagne until his sister arrived, but we still cracked open a couple of beers and clinked them together before chugging down the deliciously cold brew. It was getting dark out when Jess and Eli finally pulled into the driveway. They didn't seem overly amused about coming out here, but they changed their tune after we gave them a demonstration of our accomplishment. They both just stared on with wide eyes and slack jaws as Ray strolled through one wall and out the other. They were at a complete loss for words until we popped open the champagne and passed around glasses. I can't believe you actually pulled it off. Eli said, barely aware of the drink in his hand. I always knew you'd change the world, little brother, Jess said with a wide smile. Ray was wearing a proud look on his face as he admired his own work. Well, it's like they said, you ain't seen nothing yet, he remarked, halfway to himself. That's the second time you've mentioned they. Who the hell are they, actually? I asked. Huh? My friend replied, seemingly poor from his own thoughts. Ah, oh, figure of speech, he continued dismissively. I studied his face for a moment. He didn't look like himself at that moment. His eyes were somewhat manic again, and his lower lip appeared to be twitching. Hey, you okay, man? I asked. Huh? he replied, not taking his eyes away from the portal gun that lay on the table. After a few minutes of an incredibly awkward silence that had encompassed the room, Ray reached out and flipped the switches back to the on position. He slung the pack across his back and clutched the gun in his hand. He turned to meet Eli's curious stare. Do you trust me? he asked. His whole body looked as though it was shivering slightly. I had no idea what had gotten into him all of a sudden. I'd assisted him on a number of projects over the years, from juicing up the turbo on his Mustang to helping him convert a simple and cheap drone into something with an incredibly long range. He'd had so many projects over the years, I couldn't even guess how many different ideas he'd had, but I'd never seen him like this. Eli looked at his wife, and then over at me. He seemed uncertain and appeared to be looking for confirmation that he should indeed trust his brother-in-law. Well, Jess just shrugged, but I shook my head. I wouldn't even trust my friend with how he was acting right now. I, um, I guess, he said, sounding very unsure whether this was the best response at the moment. Without another word, Ray quickly switched the gun's knob to the exit position. His expression grew even wilder when he held it outstretched in front of him, aiming the barrel at Eli's midsection. Where, what, what are you doing, man? Elijah asked, backing away from Ray. This is going to blow your mind, my friend said in a voice that had grown high-pitched and frantic. Ray, stop, I yelled out, but he pulled the trigger before I could attempt to stop him. Jessica screamed out in terror as her husband's eyes went wide and blank. 
I just stared in shock as the portal appeared to wrap around the center of his body that left the upper and lower sections detached, held in place by the opening that glowed with a vibrant green light. I didn't see the room behind Eli through the hole, but what looked to be a completely alien landscape. With the neon light hues emitting from the void, it almost resembled gazing through night vision goggles. Jess tried to run to her husband, but I grabbed her arm and held her back. She beat on my chest while screaming out, What did you do to him? She yelled as much to me as to her brother. I don't know, I stuttered, completely lost her words. I don't know what this is. I needed her to know that I was not a part of whatever the hell this was, but that I was in complete, horrified shock myself. Ray let the gun drop to the ground beside him, and he held his arms outstretched to his sides as something began to appear from within the portal in Eli's torso. Jesus Christ, I said, as I watched two thin skeletal arms reach out and grip onto Eli's chest and upper thighs with six-fingered, elongated hands. As the creature forced its way out of Jessica's husband, the pressure from its limbs bent Elijah's chest and legs backwards into a horrifying sort of reverse sitting position. He appeared to float in mid-air, while the portal held the two halves of him together. I heard bone snap and tissue tear as a screeching face worked its way out of the hole. The head looked like a deformed human skull, with a greenish-gray skin tightly wrapped around it. The face split in the center to reveal long and widened teeth. As it shrieked, its whole head halved in the middle, making it look like a nightmare version of a Pac-Man. It had no eyes, only the wide mouth and stretched skin, that continued down to the emaciated and sunken chest that now forced through the void in Eli's body. My senses finally seemed to recover, while the thing was still attempting to escape into this world. I picked Jessica up and ran towards my truck. No! Ray screamed out, while I was attempting to force the frantic Jess into the passenger seat. There has to be two! He yelled as he came running towards us. Behind him, I saw the beast fall to the ground, after escaping through Eli's body. Though it lay on the concrete, seemingly exhausted from its transition, it looked to be quite tall. The eerily thin frame was mostly humanoid, but each limb looked twice the length of my own. Its whole body looked like an elongated skeleton, with that greyed green skin wrapped around the bones. Ray got to the side of my truck and was pulling on the door handle. I had locked it as soon as I would got in, but he just kept yanking on it until it broke off in his hand. He screamed out again, and he barely sounded human anymore. He pounded on the window, instantly causing cracks to spiderweb across it. I kicked it into reverse and shot back out of the driveway, leaving my friend to fall to his knees. I took one final glance back to see the portal disappear, and the two halves of Eli fall to the ground. Clearly, flesh does not recover as well as brick and mortar with such things. Ray attempted to run after me as I sped away from his house, but even if he hadn't still been wearing the heavy backpack, I had the pedal pushed to the floor. Once I was sure I'd put enough distance between us, I called 911. Well, I had no idea what to tell them, so I just reported a possible homicide at Ray's address. I didn't stop rolling until my truck was running on fumes. Jessica had been catatonic since she watched her husband quite literally fall to pieces before her eyes, but at least she was alive. I considered driving home, but I was certain Ray would go there first, if he was searching for his sister and I. I pulled off the interstate to find gas stations and hotels right off the exit. My passenger was still out of it, so I checked us into one of the roadside motels after filling up my gas tank. I went ahead and just got one room with two beds, so I could keep an eye on her through the night. I didn't want her to creep out or make her feel like I was holding her hostage, but my head was still spinning from the evening's events. I still couldn't believe my friend had gone so far off the deep end. Had this been his plan all along? Had he just been using me to bring whatever the hell that was into this world? Jess just lay in the bed across from me, still shaking all over. 
I'd have to try and get her help soon. Hell, I'd have to get myself help, for that matter. Her body was faced away from me, so I walked over to where she lay to check on her. Well, she was out, thankfully. I could only hope that rest would help her trouble mine. It was just then, when I was about to attempt to lay down myself, that my phone rang. I was apprehensive at first, unsure if it may be Ray attempting to contact me, but no. Given the bizarre circumstances the police found when they arrived at my friend's house, I'd have to make a statement as to the events that took place. The detective told me that they found some video footage at the scene, and I'd be required to make a statement. He sounded confident that I wouldn't be facing any charges, but they needed to hear my account of what had happened. I couldn't help but wish I'd taken the time to locate a payphone before placing the 911 call, but I wasn't exactly thinking straight. I made arrangements to have someone pick up Jessica in the morning, at which point I'd make my way to the police station. I was still very uncertain as of what to expect, but I knew Jess was going to be in need of some serious psychological care. The investigator was actually far more understanding of my apprehension and concerns than I would have expected. An ambulance arrived at the motel just a couple of hours later. Jessica was still out of it, but the paramedics assured me they'd get her the care she needed. After they took off, I headed back towards the city I fled from only a handful of hours before. Having driven for longer than I realized the previous night, it took me a while to arrive back at the station back in Ray's neck of the woods. My thoughts were all over the place, but I just wanted this nightmare to be over. Detective Leary was waiting for me in his office when I arrived. He was an older guy, but I think he appeared more aged than he really was. He had thin, brown hair that had receded back a good bit. He wore a thick moustache and rimless glasses. He spoke in a friendly tone, but his expression appeared quite stern. There were two other individuals in the room when I walked in, but they showed no motivation to introduce themselves. They both wore dark suits and had a similarly cold expression on their faces. They were both maybe in their mid-thirties. The shorter of the two had a shaved head, while the other sported a blonde buzz cut. Neither of them said a word while they just stood at the back of the room. The detective told me the two men were in charge of the investigation, though he'd be the one asking the questions. I knew nothing about any of the room's inhabitants, but Leary came off a little intimidated by the duo in the nice suits. It's very possible he was just one of those particularly skittish people, but given the pictures on the walls of seemingly very important individuals shaking the detective's hand, I had to assume it was just these particular men that made him nervous. At the officer's request, I recounted the events of the previous day, along with the details of the project we'd worked on these past three months. It was a grueling conversation, and retelling these facts caused me to physically wince multiple times. I don't think I'd allowed myself to really take in everything that had happened until this very moment. By the time I was finished with my story, I found myself just staring at the desk I sat in front of, barely holding on to my own sanity. Nobody said anything after I told my side of things, until Leary asked me to step outside for a moment. I shook my head to snap out of my vacant stare and just nodded to the man before walking out the door. A good 30 or 40 minutes passed before I was invited back in. As soon as I strolled through the open door, the two silent men walked quickly past me without so much as glancing in my direction. Well, they seem friendly, I remarked to the detective before the two were out of earshot. You have no idea, he replied. Leary went on to explain that the men in the finely tailored suits were against the idea of me seeing what he wanted to show me. He told me he thought I had the right to view the video footage they'd found. This may be tough to watch, and I'm sure you're going to need a truckload of therapy out of this. So, it's completely your call, he said, holding the remote control to the monitor that sat on the other side of the desk. I considered his words for some time before I reluctantly agreed to watch the tape. I wasn't quite ready to face the reality of everything that had occurred, but I had to know what happened next. As the video began to play, I wondered when exactly Ray had begun recording. 
I asked the detective to fast forward through the events I'd witnessed firsthand and basically cut to the chase. I stared on with wide eyes as the video sped through the horrific act that had been forced on Elijah. Poor guy didn't even have a chance. I have no doubt that even if he had denied Ray's question of trust, he would still have met the same fate. Leary started playing the tape again and I watched my truck speed away from the house with my friend screaming out after me. The skeletal creature still lay on the concrete of the garage, while Ray erratically paced back and forth. There has to be two, he was muttering over and over to himself as he walked from side to side across his lawn. There's no time, no time for more, no time at all, he continued, sounding more maniacal with every word. Just wanted to share, share with them, but no, no they wouldn't. No time, it has to be two, no time now. He went on and on, just repeating the same thoughts, each time more harried than the last. No time, he said somberly, as he came to a halt in front of the graying green thing on the floor. Has to be done. No time left. He remarked one last time before he picked the gun back off the ground. It had been dragging behind him as he darted back and forth, still wearing the heavy backpack. He stared back into the camera that had apparently been mounted close to the rear of his garage. He didn't say another word. He just raised the gun up slowly and planted the barrel into his own mouth. Since he directed the portal into his own throat, I couldn't see the opening fall. He just stood there with his head tilted back while both of his arms dropped to his side and the gun fell to the ground. For minutes he just stared motionlessly up at the sky. I audibly gasped when the long, bony fingers reached out of his mouth. They gripped at the sides of his face and forced the opening wider, splitting and tearing the flesh. I fought against the lump forming in my own throat as I looked on while Ray's face was ripped and his skull cracked and splintered. His neck bulged and tore open, while sharp twigs of rib bones pierced out of his chest. What was left of his head gave way as the thing forced its way out. Chunks of bloody meat and scarlet tissue fell to the ground, each part sounding more moist and sticky than the last. By the time the creature fell to the ground beside the other, which had only now begun to move, my friend was completely split apart from the abdomen up. He still stood in place, with his hands almost touching the ground, as what remained of his shoulders now hung by his waistline. Leary turned off the tape after that last part, but I still just glared blankly at the screen. He wouldn't give me any insight into the investigation, nor would he tell me if the creatures were still there when the police arrived. I was asked to sign an agreement that I would not speak of this, but I assumed nobody would believe me anyway. I kept my word, until now. It's been about a year since that awful night, and I've been attending regular therapy since. Jess is still in the mental institution, but she finally started speaking again a few months back. I make sure to visit her at least once a week, and she's slowly coming back to herself. Though I highly doubt she'll ever be the same as she was before all of this madness. I have no way of knowing what ever happened to the monstrous beings that were birthed through my friends by the way of the portal gun that I helped create. I can't speak to the location of said invention either. Whether it's connected or not, I've been receiving calls from Ray's phone the last few days. I finally broke down and answered it last night. I don't know how, but it was my friend's voice on the other end. He sounded different, which is not surprising as his head was fragmented into bony and bloody chunks. But somehow, I believe it was him. I have no idea how that could even be possible. Two more, it said. Has to be two more. I immediately hung up the phone and threw it to the ground. I stomped the damn thing with the heel of my foot until it was just a scattering of plastic and glass. I can't be sure of what those words meant, but I'm not sticking around to find out. I'm packing up my shit and getting the hell out of Dodge. Hopefully I can convince Jess to come with me. If I can even get her out of the institution she's in. Either way, I won't wait around to see what happens next. 
I can't know what my friend's true motivation was behind all of this. Just, please, understand? I never would have let it get this far if I could have known what he intended. He said, we'd change the world, together. The following pages are from a notebook that was discovered lying at the foot of an oak tree beside the Lincoln Highway, between Bowman and Oban. They would have been dismissed immediately as the work of a disordered mind if it had not been for the unaccountable disappearance, eight days before, of James Buckingham and Edgar Halpin. Experts testified that the handwriting was undoubtedly that of Buckingham, a silver dollar and a handkerchief marked with Buckingham's initials were also found not far from the notebook. Not everyone perhaps will believe that my ten years' hatred for Edgar Halpin was the impelling force that drove me to the perfecting of a most unique invention. Only those who have detested and loathed another man with the black further of the feeling I had conceived will understand the patience with which I sought to devise a revenge that should be safe and adequate at the same time. The wrong he had done me was one that must be expiated sooner or later, and nothing short of his death would be sufficient. However, I did not care to hang, not even for a crime that I could regard as nothing more than the mere execution of justice, and, as a lawyer, I knew how difficult, how practically impossible was the commission of a murder that would leave no betraying evidence. Therefore I puzzled long and fruitlessly as to the manner in which Halpin should die, before my inspiration came to me. I had reason enough to hate Edgar Halpin. We had been bosom friends all through our school days and through the first years of our professional life as law partners. But when Halpin married the one woman I had ever loved with complete devotion, all friendship ceased on my side and was replaced by an ice-like barrier of inexorable enmity. Even the death of Alice five years after the marriage made no difference, for I could not forgive the happiness of which I had been deprived the happiness that they'd shared during those years, like the thieves they were. I felt that she would have cared for me if it had not been for Halpin. Indeed, she and I had been almost engaged before the beginning of his rivalry. It must not be supposed, however, that I was indiscreet enough to betray my feelings at any time. Halpin was my daily associate in the open law firm to which we belonged, and I continued to be a most welcome and frequent guest at his home. I doubt if he ever knew that I cared greatly for Alice. I am secretive and undemonstrative by temperament, and also I am proud. No one except Alice herself ever surmised my suffering, and even she knew nothing of my resentment. Halpin himself trusted me, and, nurturing as I did the idea of retaliation at some future time, I took care that he should continue to trust me. I made myself necessary to him in all ways. I helped him when my heart was a cauldron of seething poisons. I spoke words of brotherly affection and clapped him on the back when I would rather have driven a dagger through him. I knew all the tortures and all the nausea of a hypocrite, and day after day, year after year, I made varying plans for an ultimate revenge. Apart from my legal studies and duties during those ten years, I apprised myself of everything available that dealt with the methods of murder. Crimes of passion allured me with a fateful interest, and I read untiringly the records of particular cases. I made a study of weapons and poisons, and as I studied them, I pictured to myself the death of Halpin in every conceivable way. I imagined the deed as being done at all hours of the day and night in a multitude of places. The only flaw in these dreams was my inability to think of any spot that would assure perfect safety from subsequent detection. It was my bent towards scientific speculation and experiment that finally gave me the clue I sought. I had long been familiar with the theory that other worlds or dimensions may coexist in the same space with ours, by reason of a different molecular structure and vibrational rate, rendering them intangible to us. One day, when I was indulging in a murderous fantasy, in which for the thousandth time I imagined myself throttling Halpin with my bare hands, 
It occurred to me that some unseen dimension, if one could only penetrate it, would be the ideal place for the commission of a homicide. All circumstantial evidence, as well as the corpse itself, would be lacking in other words. One would have a perfect absence of what is known as the corpus delicti. The problem of how to obtain entrance to this dimension was of course an unsolved one, but I did not feel that it would necessarily prove insoluble. I set myself immediately to a consideration of the difficulties to be overcome, and the possible ways and means. There are reasons why I do not care to set forth in this narrative the details of the various experiments to which I was drawn during the next three years. The theory that underlay my tests and researches was a very simple one, but the processes involved were highly intricate. In brief, the premise from which I worked was that the vibratory rate of objects in the fourth dimension could be artificially established by means of some mechanism, and that things or persons exposed to the influence of the vibration could be transported thereby to this alien realm. For a long time all my experiments were condemned to failure, because I was groping among mysterious powers and recondite laws whose motive, principle, I had not wholly grasped or not even hint at the basic nature of the device which brought my ultimate success, for I do not want others to follow where I have gone and find themselves in the same dismal predicament. I will say, however, that the desired vibration was attained by condensing ultraviolet rays in a refractive apparatus made of certain very sensitive materials which I will not name. The resultant power was stored in a kind of battery, and could be emitted from a vibratory disc suspended above an ordinary office chair, exposing everything beneath the disc to the influence of the new vibration. The range of the influence could be closely regulated by means of an insulating attachment. By the use of the apparatus, I finally succeeded in precipitating various articles into the fourth dimension. A dinner plate, a bust of Dante, a Bible, a French novel and a house cat. All disappeared from sight and touch in a few instants when the ultraviolet power was turned upon them. I knew that henceforth they were functioning as atomic entities in a world where all things had the same vibratory rate that had been artificially induced by means of my mechanism. Before venturing into the invisible domain myself, it was of course necessary to have some way of returning. I invented a second battery and a second vibratory disc through which by the use of certain infrared rays, the vibrations of our own world could be established. By turning the force from the disc on the very same spot where the dinner plate and other articles had disappeared, I succeeded in recovering all of them. All were absolutely unchanged, and though several months had gone by, the cat had not suffered in any way from its fourth dimensional incarceration. The infrared device was portable, and I meant to take it with me on my visit to the new realm in the company of Edgar Halpin. I, but not Halpin, would return anon to resume the threads of mundane existence. My experiments had all been carried on with utter secrecy. To mask their real nature, as well as to provide myself with the needful privacy, I built a small laboratory in the woods of an uncultivated ranch that I owned, lying midway between Oban and Bowman. Here I retired at varying intervals when I had the requisite leisure, ostensibly to conduct some chemical experiments of an educative but far from unusual type. I never admitted anyone to the laboratory, and no great amount of curiosity was evinced by friends and acquaintances regarding its contents or the tests I was carrying on. Never did I breathe a syllable to anyone that could indicate the true goal of my researches. I shall never forget the jubilation I felt when the infrared device had proven its practicality by retrieving the plate, the bust, the two volumes, and the cat. I was so eager for the consummation of my long-delayed revenge that I did not even consider a preliminary personal trip into the fourth dimension. I had determined that Edgar Halpin must precede me when I went. I did not feel, however, that it would be wise to tell him anything concerning the real nature of my device or the uh, proposed excursion. Halpin at this time was suffering from recurrent attacks of terrific neuralgia. One day, when he complained more than usual, 
I told him under the seal of confidence that I had been working on a vibratory invention for the relief of such maladies and had finally perfected it. I'll take you out to the laboratory tonight. You can try it, I said. It'll fix you up in a jiffy. All you'll have to do will be to sit on a chair and let me turn on the current. But don't say anything to anybody. Thanks, old man, he rejoined. I'll certainly be grateful if you can do anything to stop this damnable pain. It feels like electric drills boring through my head all the time. I had chosen my time well, for all things were favourable to the maintenance of the secrecy I desired. Halpin lived on the outskirts of the town, and he was alone for the nonce, his housekeeper having gone away on a brief visit to some sick relative. The night was murky and foggy, and I drove to Halpin's house and stopped for him shortly after the dinner hour, when few people were abroad. I do not think anyone saw us when we left the town. I followed a rough and little used by road for most of the way to my laboratory, saying that I did not care to meet other cars in the thick fog, if I could avoid it. We passed no one, and I felt this was a good omen, and that everything had combined to further my plan. Halpin uttered an exclamation of surprise when I turned on the lights in my laboratory. I didn't dream he had so much stuff here, he remarked peering about with respectful curiosity as the long array of unsuccessful appliances which I had thrown aside in the course of my labours. I pointed to the chair above which the ultraviolet vibrator was suspended. Take a seat, Ed, I enjoined him. We'll soon cure everything that ails you. Sure you ain't gonna electrocute me, he joked as he obeyed my direction. A thrill of fierce triumph ran through me like the stimulation of some rare elixir. When he had seated himself, everything was in my power now, and the moment of recompense for my ten years' humiliation and suffering was at hand. Halpin was so unsuspecting. The thought of any danger to himself, of any treachery on my part, would have been fantastically incredible to him. Putting my hand beneath my coat... I caressed the hilt of the hunting knife that I carried. All set? I asked him. Sure, Mike. Go ahead and shoot. I'd found the exact range that would involve all of Halpin's body without affecting the chair itself. Fixing my gaze upon him, I pressed the little knob that turned on the current of vibratory rays. The result was practically instantaneous for he seemed to melt like a puff of thinning smoke. I could still see his outlines for a moment, and the look of a phantasmal astonishment on his face. And then he was gone. Utterly gone. Perhaps it will be a source of wonderment that, having annihilated Halpin as far as all earthly existence was concerned, I was not content merely to leave him in the unseen, intangible plane to which he had been transposed. Would that I had been content to do so. But the wrong I'd suffered was hot and cankerous within me, and I could not bear to think that he still lived in any form or upon any plane. Nothing but absolute death would suffice to assuage my resentment, and the death must be inflicted by my own hand. It now remained to follow Halpin into that realm which no man had ever visited before, and of whose geographical conditions and characteristics I had formed no idea whatsoever. I felt sure, however, that I could enter it and return safely, after disposing of my victim. The return of the cat left no apparent room for doubt on that score. I turned out the lights, and seating myself in the chair with a portable infrared vibrator in my arms, I switched on the ultraviolet power. The sensation I felt was that of one who falls with nightmare velocity into a great gulf. My ears were deaf with the intolerable thunder of my descent. A frightful sickness overcame me, and I was near to losing all consciousness for a moment, in the black vortex of roaring space and force that seemed to draw me in a deer wood through the ultimate pits. Then the speed of my fall was gradually retarded, and I came gently down to something that was solid beneath my feet. There was a dim glimmering of light that grew stronger as my eyes accustomed themselves to it, 
and by this light I saw Halpin standing a few feet away. Behind him were dark, amorphous rocks and the vague outlines of a desolate landscape of low mounds and primordial, treeless flats. Even though I'd hardly known what to expect, I was somewhat surprised by the character of the environment in which I found myself. At a guess, I would have said that the fourth dimension would be something more colorous and complex and varied a land of multifueled hues and many angled forms. However, in its drear and primitive desolation, the place was truly ideal for the commission of the act I had intended. Halpin came toward me in the doubtful light. There was a dazed and almost idiotic look on his face, and he stuttered a little as he tried to speak. Oh, what happened? he articulated at last. Never mind what happened. It isn't a circumstance to what's going to happen now. I laid the portable vibrator aside on the ground as I spoke. The dazed look was still on Halpin's face when I drew the hunting knife and stabbed him through the body with one clean thrust. In that thrust, all the stifled hatred, all the cankering resentment of ten insufferable years was finally vindicated. He fell in a twisted heap, twitched a little, and lay still. The blood oozed very slowly from his side and formed a puddle. I remember wondering at its slowness even then, for the oozing seemed to go on through hours and days. Somehow, as I stood there, I was obsessed by a feeling of utter unreality. No doubt the long strain I'd been under, the daily stress of injured emotions and decade-deferred hopes, had left me unable to realize the final consummation of my desire when it came. The whole thing seemed no more than one of the homicidal daydreams in which I'd imagined myself stabbing Halpern to the heart and seeing his hateful body lie before me. At length, I decided that it was time to effect my return, for surely nothing could be gained by lingering any longer inside Halpin's corpse amid the unutterable dreariness of the fourth dimensional landscape. I erected the vibrator in a position where its rays could be turned upon myself and pressed the switch. I was aware of a sudden vertigo and felt that I was about to begin another descent into fathomless vortical gulfs. But, though the vertigo persisted, nothing happened and I found that I was still standing beside the corpse, in the same dismal milieu. Dumbfoundment and growing consternation crept over me. Apparently, for some unknown reason, the vibrator would not work in the way I'd so confidently expected. Perhaps in these new surroundings, there was some barrier to the full development of the infrared power. I do not know, but at any rate, there I was in a truly singular and far from agreeable predicament. I do not know how long I fooled in a mounting frenzy with the mechanism of the vibrator, in the hope that something had temporarily gone wrong and could be remedied, if the difficulty were only found. However, all my tinkerings were of no avail. The machine was in perfect working order, but the required force was wanting. I tried the experiment of exposing small articles to the influence of the rays. A silver coin in a handkerchief dissolved and disappeared very slowly. I felt they must have regained the levels of mundane existence, but evidently the vibrational force was not strong enough to transport a human being. Finally, I gave it up and threw the vibrator to the ground. In the surge of a violent despair that came upon me, I felt the need of muscular action of prolonged movement, and I started off at once to explore the weird realm in which I had involuntarily imprisoned myself. It was an unearthly land, a land such as might have existed before the creation of life. There were undulating blanks of desolation beneath the uniform grey of a heaven without moon or sun or stars or clouds, from which an uncertain and diffused glimmering was cast upon the world beneath. There were no shadows, for the light seemed to emanate from all directions. The soil was a grey dust in places, and a grey fissidity of slime in others, and the mounds I've already mentioned were like the backs of prehistoric monsters heaving from the primal ooze. There were no signs of insect or animal life. There were no trees, no herbs, not even a blade of grass, a patch of moss or lichen, or a trace of algae. 
Many rocks were strewn chaotically through the desolation, and their forms were such as an idiotic demon might have devised in aping the handiwork of God. The light was so dim that all things were lost at a little distance, and I could not tell whether the horizon was near or far. It seems to me that I must have wandered on for several hours, maintaining as direct a course of progression as I could. I had a compass, a thing that I always carry with me, but it refused to function, and I was driven to conclude that there were no magnetic poles in this new world. Suddenly, as I rounded a pile of the vast, amorphous boulders, I came to a human body that lay huddled on the ground, and say, incredulously, that it was Halpin. The blood still oozed from the fabric of his coat, and the pool it had formed was no larger than when I'd begun my journey. I felt sure that I'd not wandered in a circle, as people are said to do amid unfamiliar surroundings. How, then, could I have returned to the scene of my crime? Oh, the problem nearly drove me mad as I pondered it, and I set off with frantic vigour in an opposite direction from the one I'd first taken. For all intents and purposes, the scene which I now passed was identical with the one that lay on the other side of Halpin's course. It was hard to believe that the low mounds, the drear levels of dust and ooze and the monstrous boulders were not the same as those among which I had made my former way. As I went, I took out my watch with the idea of timing my progress, but the hands had stopped at the very moment when I had taken my plunge into the unknown space from the laboratory and though I wound it carefully, it refused to run. After walking an enormous distance, during which, to my surprise, I felt no fatigue whatever, I came once more to the body I had sought to leave. I think that I went really mad then for a little while. Now, after a duration of time or eternity which I have no means of computing, I am writing this penciled account on the leaves of my notebook. I am writing it beside the corpse of Edgar Halpin, from which I have been unable to flee. For a score of excursions into the dim realms on all sides have ended by bringing me back to it after a certain interval. The corpse is still fresh, and the blood has not dried. Apparently, the thing we know as time is well-nigh non-existent in this world, or at any rate is seriously disordered in its action, and most of the normal concomitants of time are likewise absent, and space itself has the property of returning always to the same point. The voluntary movements I've performed might be considered as a sort of time sequence, but, but in regard to involuntary things there is little or no time movement. I experience neither physical weariness or hunger, but the horror of my situation is not to be conveyed in human language, and hell itself can hardly have devised a name for it. When I have finished writing this narration, I shall precipitate the notebook into the levels of mundane life by means of the infrared vibrator. Some obscure need of confessing my crime and Telling my predicament to others has led me to an act which I should never have believed myself capable, for I am the most uncommunicative of men by nature. Apart from satisfying this need, the composition of my narrative is something to do. It's a temporary reprieve from the desperate madness that will surge upon me soon, and the grey, eternal horror of the limbo to which I have doomed myself beside the undecaying body of my victim. Well, look at this. If I do not waffle on too much and I just get straight to the point and say, oh, yeah, yeah, thanks for listening and all that kind of stuff, I think we can get done in an hour on the dot. What do you reckon? Huh, gone a bit too quick now. Well, couple of wonderful stories there. Really enjoyed that uh, first one, brand new. And the second one was one I've done before, but loved it and thought thematically it fit with the first one. So why not stick them both together for your Monday evening's entertainment? Well, my dear friends, it's been emotional as ever. Time for me to leave you now. So, till the next time, sweet dreams and bye-bye.